Good afternoon, everyone, and, and welcome to the, uh, uh, to the Atlantic Council for the, for the release of our latest Atlantic Council strategy paper, uh, a non-state strategy for saving cy uh, cyberspace, which is uh, authored by our Atlantic Council senior fellow, Jay, Jay Healy. It's, it's great to see everyone here today. Uh, I'm Magnus Nordeman, the deputy director of the Brent Scowcroft Center uh, on International Security here at the, uh, at the Atlantic Council. Uh, and this is our latest publication in a, in a series of strategy papers, um, uh, which, and this, is, uh, this has been preceded by, uh, by four functional strategies and two regional strategy papers that were released uh, towards the end of, of, of last year. Um, and as General uh, Scowcroft, who is, who is near and dear to our hearts here at the Atlantic Council, of course, um, likes to say that strategy is how to get from where you are to where you want to go. Um, and that's exactly what this strategy paper helps us do when it comes to, uh, when it comes to cyberspace. So Jay's strategy will help shift our thinking from offense to, to de uh, defense-centric con um, uh, centric concept when it comes to protecting cyberspace. Uh, and we hope that from this strategy can, uh, uh, can come uh, uh, public and private sector concepts and apologies um, uh, with an emphasis on contributions from, uh, from non-state actors. Uh, and of course, I, I can't think of a more timely strategy um, given the massive attention given to, to Russian hacking of our election and other high-profile events in recent times. It is, it is literally on CNN and, and other outlets as we, as we speak today. Um, so this series of strategy papers is, uh, is designed to enrich public debate uh, and help build consensus uh, here in Washington and elsewhere around some of the greatest strategic challenges uh, that face us today and, and moving forward. Um, and with the new administration set to take over later this month, uh, the council thought it was appropriate to look anew at some of the most important areas of statecraft and outline new strategies for, um, uh, for the incoming administration and, and others. Um, so to that end, um, to date we have published papers on global risks up to the year 2035, a sustainable energy strategy, a strategy for space defense, and a new global economic strategy, uh, as well as a strategy for dealing with failing states. Uh, and you can pick these up outside and, and also get them uh, from our website later on. Uh, and later this year, we will release a regional strategy for, for Latin America and East Asia, as well as functional strategies for countering violent extremism and nuclear proliferation. Uh, but today, we're, we're focusing on our, uh, on our most recent effort, uh, and the excellent effort by, by Jay on a non-state strategy for saving cyberspace. Uh, in this report, Jay argues that in order to protect cyberspace and the internet from abuse from both non-state and state actors alike, the U.S. must find a strategic and sustainable balance for its cyber interest and secure cyberspace as a means to advance prosperity, maintain an open internet to support the free flow ideas, and secure U.S. national security in and through cyberspace. Uh, and I believe Jay will, will, will dig a little deeper and dive a little deeper in, in some, of the, some of the major themes of the report later today. Uh, so joining Jay on today's panel is Siobhan Gorman, the Washington Director of the Brunswick Group, and Bobby Stemfley, who's the Director for Cyber Strategy Implementation at the MITRE Corporation. She's also a Senior Fellow with the Cyber State, uh, Statecraft Initiative here at the Council. Uh, and moderating today's discussion is Shane Harris of the, of the Wall Street Journal. Um, and of course, before, uh, before I get off stage, I want to I give a couple of shout outs and, and, and thanks to, to folks uh, that have been instrumental in the development of this series. First of all, our President and CEO, Fred Kemp, and our Board Director, uh, Alexander Merchev, who are the leaders behind our strategy paper initiative. Uh, and they are also the executive editors of the series and, and very much the intellectual driving force behind this effort. Um, I certainly also want to recognize Barry Pavel, uh, my boss, uh, the director of the, uh, of the Scowcroft Center here at the Atlantic Council, um, as well as the teams we have working under our Cyber Statecraft initiative. Um, and last but not least, I want to give a shout out to Alexander DeCoco and Alex Ward for their hard work on both their strategy paper series uh, and this rollout event. So, so thank you so much to, to Alexandra and, and, and Alex for, for their work. Um, before I get off stage and, and hand over the floor, just a couple of admin notes. Um, first of all, this event is on the record uh, and it is webcast live. So if you're not with us on, uh, uh, here in the room, you can certainly catch it uh, from your desktop. Uh, and you can join the conversation online by using at AC Scowcroft and using the AC strategy hashtag. Um, with that, Shane, um, thank you so much for, for helping us shepherd this event, and the floor is yours. Thanks. Good afternoon, everyone. If only we could have gathered together at a more newsworthy and auspicious moment for this subject. <laughs> <laughs> I'm Shane Harris of the Wall Street Journal, uh, <clears throat> where I cover national security and cybersecurity and uh, various other goings on in the news of late. Uh, I'm very pleased to be here um, talking about this paper. For those who work uh, 
in this area, certainly for journalists who write about this, uh, we all know Jay to be one of our leading thinkers, writers, uh, historians on this topic. Uh, he takes a very multidisciplinary approach to what he writes about on this area, and that is very much evidenced uh, in this paper, which I encourage everyone to read. Um, and I, I have to say that I found myself agreeing with so much of this, because in my reporting on this subject and in, in writing a book about this a few years ago, for which Jay's previous book was really a tremendous help, uh, uh, I found myself thinking, why do we keep writing and thinking about cybersecurity and cyber defense as a government-only strategy? This is never going to work. <laughs> this is too large of a problem. This is fundamentally not suited simply to a central kind of defensive strategy. And Jay really lays out, I think, a provocative and very thorough argument for why we need to start thinking about a non-state strategy, perhaps, or why this alternative might be something that people want to uh, engage on. Uh, the new administration has promised a review within 90 days of our cybersecurity posture and wants a plan. Uh, I presume President-elect Trump was going to find out that there's already been quite a lot of thinking on this subject uh, and there are already sort of plans in place. Jay addresses what some of those are and talks about their shortcomings as well. So uh, we're going to jump off from there and we're going to get into a discussion of this. Um, I'm going to hand over the floor to Jay here to describe the paper for in a moment. I will then lead a discussion amongst our panelists and I encourage you please, we're going to have Q&A, we have time reserved at the end, uh, but if you find yourself wanting to, to jump in on something that someone said or to make a point, please just give me a high sign. Uh, we don't have to wait until the end. We can have this be as much of a discussion as possible. So with that, Jay, let me turn it over to you to uh, talk about your excellent paper. Great. Uh, thank, thank you very much, Shane. Um, at first, we were a little worried about the timing on this paper. I mean, it's coming out with some cyber ideas. It wasn't, when it was originally written, meant to be kind of a transition sort of paper. But it's because of the timing, it, it, it has been um, to some degree. But we just had Obama's um, Commission on Cybersecurity a report. Um, only a few weeks ago. Jim Lewis's CSIS report um, on cybersecurity for the 45th president has just come out. And the breadth of the recommendations in those reports, I've got to say, covers more ground than mine. But what they don't have, and I don't think we have had in any of the documents that we've put forward so far on what we need to do about cybersecurity, is had that nugget of strategy that says, all right, what is it that we think we're trying to get done? When you've got the lever, where do you put that lever to try and make that happen? And, you know, we're here in the Scowcroft Center, and he talks a lot about strategy. You know, the most important strategy that we had was a single word, containment. And with that single word, we largely won the Cold War, right? And you could... We agreed, as he says, on the strategy. We disagreed on the tactics. And if you look at most of the strategies we've done, if you look at those other commission reports, which, again, are fantastic, you say, what's the strategy here? How do you relate these things when you've got competing public, public priorities that are contained in these strategies? How do you judge between these competing priorities? And this is, I think, one area that we've really fallen short. Um, as another example, um, counterinsurgency doctrine, right? If you know kind of anything about counterinsurgency doctrine, you hear, well, what are the two strategies? Kill the bad guys or win the hearts and minds of the good guys. And you can have an argument which one of those is the right strategy. If you know anything about counterinsurgency, you can sit down and have a three-hour conversation about what that nugget of strategy means for you in your particular place, whether you're a general, whether you're a colonel, whether you're, whether you're a sergeant that's going in about to visit village elders, you can know what your job is supposed to be in part by knowing what that overall strategy is. But the strategies we've put out, the documents we've, we've put out, it's hard to summarize what the strategy is in any fewer words than it takes to list all of the actions that are within them. Um, or it's a, it's a saccharine strategy like we want cyberspace to be safe. That doesn't really get you where, it doesn't help you understand the priorities. And so I've um, been working on this, this strategy for probably the better part of two years. Um, it's tied in with the work that we've done with Zurich Insurance Group. It's tied in with work that we've done with IBM, um, with other great sponsors here, where we said the number one goal that, that 
I'm trying to get across in this is a sustainable cyberspace. That when our kids and grandkids are our age, they have an internet that is at least as safe, secure, resilient, as awesome as the, ones, the one that we have today. That, that requires a whole bunch of things. Within cybersecurity, it means that we've got to, to flip the relationship between offense and defense. When I was doing the, the history book that, that Shane was, was kind enough to mention, um, I came across this quote that said, few if any contemporary computer security controls can d stop a dedicated red team. You know, it's basically saying that the attacker will always get through. But that quote was from 1979. 1979. And so all of the work that we've done, all the patents, all the tens of billions of dollars that we've spent, all the kids missed birthday parties, all the missed soccer games, everything that we've done for 1979 has been at best to stay even with the, with the attackers while our dependence has grown. And so, to me, we've got to flip this relationship. The attackers have had the advantage. We've got to flip that around so that the defenders have the advantage within an enterprise, within a sector, within a nation, and for cyberspace as a whole. Even if that turns out to be ultimately impossible, it needs to be our goal. Because if that's our goal, now we have metrics. Now we can say, all right, in the Verizon Data Breach Investigations Report, Last year, it took the attackers this long to try and figure out how to break in. Once they were in, it took them this long to be detected by the defenders, and it took them this long to be kicked out by the defenders. If we know that getting defense better than offense is our, is our strategy, then we can look and hopefully we'll see those numbers coming down, that the defenders are keeping them out longer, detecting them faster, and kicking them out faster. Now, to me, the, the last bit that goes into this is, what's the theory of the case? How do we make that happen to get defense better than offense? And here, this dates back to, to some of the very first writing I'd done with Greg Rattray. Um, I think it was, a, it was either a CNAS report or a National Academy of Science report. And Greg and I were asked to, uh, another Atlantic Council senior fellow, and we were asked to write about non-states. And we said, all right, we got it. And we went right down the way that you normally do if you're going to write about non-states. Their capability intent to do evil things to the rest of us. Right? If you think non-state in this field, in this town, that's largely the way that if you say non-states that you're going to go. And, we, and as we got into it, Greg and I were saying, no, we need to think about the capability intent of non-states as good guys. We need to increase their capability to do defense. We need to increase um, their intent to do good things. We can't scare off the non-states by, by pushing the state action and getting them to no longer see us as allies when it comes to cybersecurity. And so that is square in what we tried to do in this report. Not just industry, right? So I had some people say, well, this should be an industry strategy. And it's not industry. That implies carriers. That implies ISPs. That implies um, the cybersecurity giants. Um, others said private sector. And even private sector was too restrictive. Mm -hmm. Um, even though that now brings in um, companies that are using, you know, small and medium-sized enterprise, for example. We wanted non-state because we wanted to include those individual security researchers that are out hunting a bug bounty. We wanted to include uh, the volunteer groups that are out there, these trust-based groups that are out there sharing information day in, day out about the bad things that are happening. Groups like the Configure Working Group that came together in, in one of the, the worst incidents of malware that we'd seen, um, and were using their personal credit cards to try and stop the march of, of that malicious software. So there's more in there um, about how we get there, how we got to this place. But it all comes down to we want a sustainable cyberspace. The way to get there, at least in cybersecurity, is we've got to get de give the defender the advantage so that it's stacked up on our side, the defenders versus the attackers. So the attackers have a tougher job. And how we get there is wherever possible, the private sector is the supporting, is the supported command. And that is the government is the supported command, I'm sorry, the supporting command to try and help them do those things. Um, it turns out the timing was relatively fortuitous that it came out during transition. 
Um, you know, I just came from meeting with Tom Bossert, the president's, uh, the president-elect's Homeland Security Advisor, um, also an Atlantic Council Fellow, had been involved with us in our early Zurich group, um, work with the Zurich Insurance Group. Um, if you look at his statement that was issued um, two weeks ago, you can see statements from the strategy in there about the private sector, about American values, and things like that. Tom was sorry he couldn't be here today, um, but he, he, he did say he, he associates himself with, with, with the report and the kinds of ideas in there. So, so you're having an effect time. already before you've uh, no, the report. Yeah. That's good. Yeah. Um, so I want to, in, in, in talking about the solutions, one of the things I want to start by doing is, is you, you lay out what you see as a number of the problems with the current policy of the way that we do defense. Mm -hmm. And one of the ones that resonated with me is this idea that, you, that there are conflicting priorities for how people who are thinking about defending the internet are operating in, in it or looking through it. There's this national security lens. There are people who look at the internet as something we're more concerned with economic prosperity. There's a criminal justice element that's associated mm -hmm. with, with uh, policing the internet. Talk just a bit about and flesh those out of how these competing priorities for how you do defense in cyberspace have kind of led to probably no <laughs> single strategy of defense. <laughs> right. I mean, if you ask what is our strategy right now, we have to go back to the 2003 strategy. Um, even the, the international strategy for cyberspace, which I originally loved, came out in 2010, um, it didn't include United States wanting to use cyber for offense and intelligence purposes. And then when the Snowden revelations came out, it seemed quite shallow that we, we had released these documents that said, oh, someone else might attack the United States using cyber, and if that happens, we might have to use cyber back, mm -hmm. when it turns out you know, we, we are using this um, uh, quite actively, and that wasn't included in those strategies, and therefore, I think it, um, they weren't really strategic because they weren't giving you that, uh, that kind of balance. Of course, in, in the last year, this really came out in the Apple FBI, where you really saw this um, uh, come out more significantly in, the, in this tug of war, it was the right thing. And, and this administration, which, which I think has done, overall done a, done, done a solid job um, on this, they would continue, and even from, from President Obama, talk about a balance. Well, saying it's a balance doesn't really mean anything. I mean, is it, is it a 50-50 balance? Is it a 95-5% balance? Is it a 5% and 95%? percent balance. I mean, if you've got, <laughs> um, you know, a big 400-pound hacker and a little five-pound, you know, uh, wait on, the, you know, th those two things can still be in balance depending on where you put, depending on where you put the fulcrum. Saying it's a balance doesn't help you when you're a decision maker, when you're a policy maker, and something, a new issue comes across your desk, and you say, "What does the boss want me to decide here?" Put it the, and put it this way: for this current administration. If something came across their desk about, you know what, we've got new coal power plants that we want to do and a new coal mine that, that we want um, in, in Appalachia, what way do you think they're going to come down on that? We've got more than enough to know with this administration. They're going to say, well, I'll tell you, we are really worried about the environment, and this has to be a really, really strong case for us to come off of that. What is their stand when it comes to if we have to make trade-offs between offense or espionage and cyberspace about law enforcement access um, to cryptography or to phones versus cybersecurity and trying to keep us all safe? It's a balance. Well, that doesn't give us the answer about where that balance is going to come down. And so what I hope for the next administrations uh, in this country as well as others, is that we know where they're going to come down as clear as you know where, where the Obama administration would come down on environmental issues. Well, maybe that's a question I could ask Bobby. I mean, do you have a sense of where they might be coming down? I mean, I, I think back to when President Obama came in and national cybersecurity strategy was something that they were tackling from the get-go. I mean, he presented a, 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 the beginnings of a strategy in May 2009. It was something that they clearly signaled we're going to be thinking about mm -hmm. this and moving on this. I mean, if you're, where do you see the Trump administration coming? And maybe you want to take the measure a little bit of uh, where we ended up with the Obama plan. So one of the things that I found, um, I, I described to my kids the day that President Obama used the word cybersecurity in the State of the Union, mm -hmm. right? Mm -hmm. I, I was like, 
wow, I could not have imagined five years ago that having happened. Mm -hmm. And it happened, right? The day Symantec put their first radio ad on the radio <laughs> was 2001, I think. We were doing something different at that time. And, and this was not a world that engineers ever imagined happening. So clearly, the administration has been very focused on trying to move the ball. Um, but I, I describe one of the challenges that we long have in cyber is that um, we're victims of our DNA, hmm. right? It, it started with encryption. Encryption is math. For a large part of the population, for some bizarre reason, being an engineer, I don't understand it. Mm -hmm. For some bizarre reason, they sort of start with math. Math is, I don't want to talk math. Or it was sort of the bane of the intelligence community. And we don't talk about that. Mm -hmm. Right? Mm -hmm. At all. We never talk about that. And so the ability to have a rationed conversation about what decisions need to be made and how you might go about making them has been an intractable problem, I think, for at least for me, uh, for the last several years. We've, we've had a lot of conversations about it. We've made a lot of progress. Right? I, I look at all of the, the documents the administration has put out and how far the ball has moved. It's been wonderful. Mm -hmm. But to, to the point of the paper, I think, we haven't been able to really shape what are the real conversations that need to be had and how do we frame making those decisions in any kind of, of strategy. And, and I'm a cybersecurity geek, a, a self-proclaimed um, in, in that space, having done this for a rather long time, um, we, the only people we bring to the table are cybersecurity experts. Mm -hmm. And so we have a laundry list of, of, of solutions that are about doing more of the same and not about really embracing the complexity that exists and using that to our advantage. Mm -hmm. Siobhan, you've spent your career I mean, writing about the evolution <laughs> of both the threat and the response to it. And, I mean, and, and, and like Bobby is saying, there was a time where you could not get people in government to have a frank conversation with you about anything related to this field because we were going to be disclosing vulnerabilities <coughs> or we were going to disclose sources and methods of intelligence gathering. Now you're in the business also of helping people in the private sector communicate about this. I mean, talk a little bit just about that, that evolution too as you see it. And from the point of view of the people who you work with now, who are the targets yeah. <laughs> of so much of what's going on out there. Um, kind of, how do you think a strategy like the one that Jay is proposing resonates with them? Because I, I assume they're not all waiting around for the Homeland Security Department to come in and, and save them from hackers. No, no. Although when you're in the middle of a breach, sometimes you look kind of almost anywhere <laughs> <You'll> take <anything. laughs> um, to, to help. Yeah, and, and, and I think um, just a, a couple things that I was thinking about also as Bobby was talking. Um, you know, one of the challenges that you have with kind of a, a state-oriented cybersecurity strategy, and when we look to the government for a cybersecurity strategy, that's exactly what you would expect to get, is that if, if you remember, cybersecurity started getting cool at the end of the Bush administration. That's when you had the Comprehensive National Cybersecurity mm -hmm. Initiative, and all of a sudden you saw billions of dollars flowing to it. Um, and, and still then, to Shane's question, people were still very uncomfortable talking about it. And um, having fairly recently had Shane's job and having, um, you know, doing that reporting over time, I thought it was amazing that it was actually easier to report on counterterrorism than mm -hmm. it was on cybersecurity for a long time, and that, that may well still hold today because people were so uncomfortable talking about it. Um, and, and part of it was that it was kind of intermingled with the intelligence community. And in fact, I started covering cybersecurity um, back when I was at the Baltimore Sun because I was covering the National Security Agency. And um, the, the, the interesting thing about kind of the evolution of the way the government has approached this is that cybersecurity really started to become a, a major focus of public policy in the Bush administration, but also right after the warrantless surveillance debate, which now feels like it was ages ago because that was like way pre-Snowden, but it was actually the same set of issues being debated. Yeah. And when the Obama administration came in, they also didn't want to be sort of tarred with the surveillance um, sort of uh, 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 you know, label. And so everybody has tried to get away from overly prescriptive sort of government you know, requirements and regulations um, or government involvement in policing the internet 
because it was getting too close to surveillance. And so one of the interesting things I think about Jay's approach is that if you can get away from kind of these government-driven approaches, you can start to get away from some of the things that have really held um, certainly the United States and presumably other countries as well um, back from trying to address some of these problems because you find yourself sort of dancing around voluntary standards, which is really only going to get you so far. Yeah. Data sharing is only going to get you so far. And at some level, I feel like we've, we've, we've reached at least for now some of the limits of where you run up to against in, in government and you have to look somewhere else. And do you think, I mean, in, in general, this is broadly speaking, but I'm curious, have people in the private sector who are the targets of breaches and who are, who are you know, coming under attack every day, have they learned more about how to take care of themselves uh, simply by being victims and sharing information with each other about what it's like to be a victim, or because the government has paid more attention and is talking more openly now about the threat from state actors and Russia and China? I think it depends on the nature of the breach. If you do feel like you know you're a company and you're you're contending with a state actor type of threat as opposed to a um, cyber criminal threat, and obviously there's some commingling there, uh, particularly with our friends from Russia. But um, you know, it it depends. I do think that companies still tend to be very private when it comes to cybersecurity. Um, you know. Uh, Corporate leaders tend to look at larger business issues, weighing risk and things like that, and they tend to delegate cybersecurity issues. And one of the things when we talk to companies is to talk about how you it's it actually is to everybody's benefit, especially before you're actually dealing with some sort of cyber crisis, to have conversations across the company about what the business implications are, either of having a major cyber incident or perhaps benefits of you know investing in security on on the front end. And so. Um, um, I think that right now companies, and, and some companies are very advanced, certainly in the tech sector and, and certain you know, financial sector and things like that, but for companies outside of the few sectors that have been paying attention to this for a long time, it often still feels very new. And when we sit down to do more of a kind of a preparatory exercise uh, where we'll go around and say interview different components of the company, oftentimes um, you're still doing a lot of education uh, to human resources or sometimes even legal counsel about why it is is that they need to care ahead of time about potentially dealing with the cyber breach. So I think that it's still very, very uneven. The government has come a long way. The private sector is still a little bit scattered. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And Jay, you talk about, and also in the context of shortcomings in the current <clears throat> way that we think about defense, and this largely goes to the way that I guess the government thinks about it, but this idea of the militarization of mm -hmm. cyberspace. I mean, talk a bit about that, and I, and, I, and I note that the incoming administration seems to be, it seems to be inclined from their initial mm -hmm. sort of signals that they think that cyber defense is something that the Defense Department should be handling, right. which mm -hmm. is not exactly how the policy is on paper aligned <laughs> out, but, but yeah. talk about it for that. Yeah, I mean, if there was going to be a, a counter in a theory, it would, I think it would be that no government needs to be in charge. You know, and, and you know, I associate this position, you know, with with some degree of unfairness with, with General Alexander. You know, with the America cyber power is centered on Route 32, right? I mean, that Fort Meade. If you're looking at America cyber power, that you know, you start with Fort Meade and then you work your way out. Um, in, in our, in, you know, in this strategy, we're saying no. Our, our cyber power is in um, Silicon Valley. It's in Route 128. It's in, um, you know, it's in the places that are building and maintaining cyberspace and filling it with content that the world work, uh, that the world wants. Um, you know, there's a time in this country if you talked about our maritime power, you would probably be talking about uh, the Merchant Marine and American mer flagged merchant vessels um, built in the United States, sailing around the world, bringing you know, bringing our goods um, uh, to all of the continents. And now, of course, if you talk about our maritime power, you're probably talking about the U.S. Navy. And, um, and here, I think that helps us think about what, what we want that, our, our cyber power to be, and we shouldn't lose sight of that. Um, and to me, the, that militarization really came in with, um, there was a comment, we was, um, I was in Tallinn, Estonia for their, for their great SciCon conference every year, and General Alexander was speaking in, and I, don't, I think it's the only time he ever gave the speech, it was his red Lamborghini speech. <coughs> and he said uh, to the audience, which is mostly Europeans, uh, he said, uh, look, as the head of US Cyber Command, I neither need nor want to try and track what's happening on all of your networks. Um, imagine, though, that 
um, all the world's networks are highways. And on those world highways, there is a very, very dangerous cyber attack. We'll call it a red Lamborghini. And what I need from all of you is to let me know when you see that red Lamborghini so that I can stop it. And the audience was, oh, OK, yeah, OK, that makes sense. You know, that's, that's, that's an interesting analogy. I get that. I, I like Lamborghinis, right? Um, and I was thinking, man, this is, what a government-centric view. Because one, the red Lamborghini is probably going to be classified. Um, we're not going to tell you about it. Um, two, are you really going to tell the head of Cyber Command, who's also the head of the NSA, um, about this? And three, even if you tell him, what can he do? What can anyone in the US government actually do if you find out the dangerous cyber attack is coming? Right? I mean, I guess you could push new signatures to Einstein. Right? You could better protect the federal government. You could push an indicator out, I guess, to, to ISAOs. But there are no buttons that are actually connected. Oh, you could, you could counterattack if you really knew it was happening. You might be able to, to, to shoot a magic bullet to try and stop it, stop it from coming in. But very few of the buttons and levers at Cyber Command actually are connected to the actual internet or to the defense. Um, but what could happen and what actually does happen, you know, if Deutsche Telekom is seeing that attack and they know it's going to hit British Telecom and it's going to hit AT&T, instead of telling Cyber Command, they, tell each other. they just tell each other, right? They say, hey, by the way, the Red Lamborghini is coming. This already happens. It happens all of the time. We don't need additional authorities to make it happen. We don't need to hire a new set of cyber ninjas that are going to sit at Fort Meade to make it happen. Um, we don't need to give more clearances. There are, nine, there are already nine players on the field. And instead of having one player, the US government, run around yelling, I got it, I got it, I got it, we need to do, what else can we do to get all nine players involved? Maybe they don't have the skills they need. Maybe they don't have a good enough glove. Um, maybe they don't even know they're actually playing the game. That was me when I was, you know, they just stick me in the outfield. <laughs> um, but the more that we can recognize that we've got those nine players on the field and what can we do to help them out? Um, what can we do to, to um, engage them, empower them, and where necessary enforce? Bobby, I'm curious if you agree with you know, one Jay's diagnosis that, of, yeah, the, uh, <laughs> of the, uh, the, the militarization. And, and if so, you know, I mean, what is it with this strategy? I mean, why have we driven as I, because I, I, I'll confess, I do agree that he's, and I, I think that this is General why I Alexander. So much, eh? right, yes, so we're, we're, thinking, we're not going to disagree on this stuff. But <laughs> yeah, General Alexander is a useful proxy for that strategy yeah. to a certain extent. So I mean, what, what is it that you see that has been driving policy in this area that has led it more towards this, kind of put the DOD in charge, which is not to say that these other components of government, the FBI, the Homeland Security Department, don't play a role, but, uh, or disagree if you think that, that we have kind of militarized our strategy in that respect. So uh, let me share with you a really interesting moment of my life as a civil servant. <laughs> mm -hmm. right, so um, I spent 23 and a half years in the federal government as a civil servant working for the Defense Department um, and for the Department of Homeland Security. I did cybersecurity in the Defense Department pre cybercom pre-Joint Force Headquarters uh, uh, computer network operations, mm -hmm. Pre-joint <laughs> JTF. Pre -computers? Pre exactly. Next to the first day I came as a civil servant, we were actually connecting dot matrix <laughs> printers in my office. It was there's a whole other story there. Um, but but I mean, since before there was uh, a, a a structure, a military structure around this, when it was a bunch of us geeks in an old Navy warehouse refabbed as an office building, um, trying to do some things. I, this story doesn't go that far back. Um, this was actually post-implementation uh, of the Affordable Care Act. Mm -hmm. I had the privilege of testifying for two hours and 42 minutes um, with one other witness uh, in front of the House Homeland Security and Government Affairs Committee, which was, in an odd uh, environment, a committee that was generally receptive to cybersecurity mm -hmm. issues. Mm -hmm. And as a career civil servant, um, you know, I actually, the, the Democrats liked us generally and the Republicans liked us generally, right? So I didn't care about party, but it was this odd moment. But in this moment, I was asked two questions within 10 minutes. 
And the first question was, cyber, do you agree that cybersecurity, or something along these lines, I'm not going to get it exactly right, but do you agree cybersecurity is so complicated that we need the Defense Department to be in charge? Huh. Hmm. It's such a complicated environment. It's, you know, we can't, DHS obviously can't get themselves organized, which I took personal <laughs> affront for, given that was my job. Um, but thank you very much for uh, that critique. Um, but you know, do you agree with that? And then the second question, um, a few minutes later, I can't remember if it was from the same congressman or it might have been one other, was why do you think the government can do anything with a really complicated problem? The government has no experience being successful with complicated problems. We mm. should take our, our, our advice from industry. Mm. Right? Within 10 minutes, you sort of felt like you'd gone down mm. the rabbit hole mm -hmm. um, in, that, uh, in that moment. Because you're, you're sitting here trying to explain, and in credit, your, your paper rightly points out, the level of complexity is unbelievable and growing. And so it's... You know, how do you sort of handle this, um, handle this environment? And it's easy to back away and say, it's too hard for me to understand. I need to make it somebody else's problem. It's a problem at scale. We solve problems at scale with bureaucracies. The government is a great example of overcoming scale by putting bureaucracy in place. Shouldn't they take it on? Yeah. Right? I mean, that logic for many people holds. But when you're talking about what do you do, if I, if I would have to stand up in front of the, the MITRE board and say, uh, you know, something has gone wrong, or, or when I was at DHS or any one of my, my friends who are, are CISOs or CIOs stand up in front of their board and someone would say, we, we're about to be hacked, or we've been, or there's been a breach, what do we do? And if the answer were, we should share more, right? That's the answer, we should share more. How many people in the room would think that a satisfying response, <laughs> right? But that's been, that's been the response. We have to have meaningful things to say in this complexity at scale. Um, and we really have a lot of work to do. It's clearly been seen as a, a, you know, the Defense Department can do it. And right. it takes a whole community and one made up of many of these non-state activities. That's where the power is. I, I might sure. add a, a couple things to that, too. Um, I think it also has to do with just uh, both awareness and budget. Um, and, uh, you know, I mean, the, the, the CNCI really was what drove cyber in, in the budget, mm -hmm. you know, mm -hmm. for modern times, let's say. Um, and that was centered largely in a classified zone, which by definition was going to be in the intelligence community and was largely kind of in NSA slash DOD. Um, so if NSA and, and DOD are seen as the engine within the federal government, I mean, I don't know how many times I heard, oh, well, DHS just can't handle it. So we have, I mean, at one point someone told me that, that, that NSA and DHS were working on something because NSA had a better contracting vehicle. And I, I had spent a fair amount of time covering NSA contract. And that was not their strong suit. And I was like, really? <laughs> but it was sort of this default that you would see, um, and I'm not trying to pick on NSA, but you, you would you would sort of or see DHS. this, or well, I'm definitely not picking on DHS, but um, but but you would see this default to well NSA, you know, they're they're the ninjas, they're they're magicians, they can they can right. make that work. Um, and then in addition, um, just having spent time covering this as a journalist and frankly trying to increase awareness um, of cybersecurity as just a thing, um, that was largely driven by the federal government. And you still see that. I mean, um, you know, when when we look at it now, sort of from a communications standpoint, in my in my current job, I mean, the the U.S. is this huge zone of awareness, and it is almost nothing in other parts of the world, including in, in Europe and even the U.K., where they've seen major cybersecurity issues, um, because the U.S. government has been a major driver of awareness yeah. as well, and so that has really shaped the story um, for for cybersecurity in the United States, and to some degree in in the world at this point. But I, I think one of the awareness things, one of the hopes was as people got more aware, right, you know more, you'll do more. And, and I think the, uh, we know this from lots of other areas that just knowing more doesn't change behavior, mm -hmm. that you have to do something else in order to change Knowledge behavior. Knowledge is not power. Knowledge, <laughs> it, it, right, I mean, we know this in the medical industry, we know this in dental, or we, we know this from from lots of places. So we have to fix that 
at least part of our understanding of how we change. Which actually leads to a good question for Jay, which is, so how do you elevate defense? Because I thought yeah, I, yeah. I thought that the paper was was really interesting, and and I agreed with the thrust of it, but the how you get there is a little bit hard, yeah. and it's hard for me to get my head around. So I'm just wondering, sort of, how you're thinking about that. The um, it, it, this fits in with a lot of the with work that we've been doing at Columbia University School of International Public Affairs, where I am now. Um, and, and to me, it even starts out with just saying we can do defense better. We just suck at it, right? I mean, we've just got to have the right ideas. We've got to have the we've got to have the strategy. We've got to work towards that strategy. And 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 I think even just having that as a goal is going to help, because I think there's this frustration, right? There's this frustration that defense doesn't work, that defense is feckless. So therefore, that's one reason why we reach out to DOD, um, right? We say, well, they can get tough things done, which they can. Um, but also we say, well, defense doesn't work, so we need to attack back. And you've heard this so much in the last <laughs> two years. Two weeks. <laughs> right. <laughs> defense doesn't work, so we have to attack back. And so, and so to me, I think now more than ever, we've got to try one last time to try and get, get the defense right. And so the work that we're doing with Columbia University CEPA, we have a New York Cyber Task Force. So the co-chairs are my dean, Merritt Janow, um, Greg Rattray, and Phil Venables. Mm. I'll tell you, most of the last 20 years of my professional life has either been with Greg Rattray or <laughs> Phil Venables. Um, uh, Greg um, uh, Goldman Sachs and J.P. Morgan Chase currently. And we've got Ed Amoroso and Matt Waxman and Steve Belevin and Dimitro Perovich and Jeff Moss and, and plenty of other, other fantastic, Angela McKay, plenty of other fantastic people um, are, helping, are helping us out. And we said, and we kind of picked up this, to take this the next place. Because um, Phil would always talk about how do I get a more defensible architecture within, within my firm. Greg and I would always talk about the ecosystem or the environment and how can we make that more defensible. And so we said, what, what is it that we can do to make cyberspace more defensible, to get defense better than offense? Uh, Greg doesn't necessarily like the defense better than offense formulation. And so we, we started out with saying, what, what seems so obvious in retrospect, what have we done as cyber defenders in the last 40 years that has most been defense advantage, that has most given us the advantage over the attackers? And we look across technology, operations, and policy within the enterprise and across cyberspace as a whole. And so he said, um, firewalls, intrusion detection systems, uh, you know, were, um, were def absolutely important innovations within the enterprise for technology. Windows update, end-to-end -end encryption mm -hmm. are important things um, that aid the defense across cyberspace as a whole. Um, within operations, developing the idea of a computer emergency response team in 1988, developing the idea of a chief information security officer in 1995, developing the doctrine of the cyber kill chain in the 2000s, um, automated information sharing, creating ISACs, or all these operational measures. And then we looked at policy, things from SEC guidance to um, uh, holding boards responsible and helping boards under, un, understand this. Um, Budapest Convention, Computer Fraud and Abuse Act. And we try to look across all of these and say, what has made these successful? And therefore, let's do more of that. And the report right now is called Leverage. Because you said all too often we roll out things that aren't in defense advantage. Or that they only, if you input X into it, you get X out. You know, it's going to cost the, the attackers X to circumvent that. You need a multiplier. Yeah, compli like compliance-based systems, the Vossenar agreement. Um, you know, we had an event here at the Atlanta Council where, if you know Vossenar, it's this arm, um, dual use arms export agreement. And one of the cybersecurity companies said, right now we need 10 export licenses. If this Vossenar agreement gets implemented the way you're talking about, we stopped counting at 1,000. So here's something that puts incredible obstacles in the way of defenders, but it's hardly going to cost the attackers anything to bypass. Compare that to Windows Update, where whatever, it wasn't cheap for Microsoft to do Windows Update in, what, 98? But if they spent X on it, we've probably gotten literally 1,000 X, 100,000 I mean, we might literally have gotten a million X back on that investment for, our, for us as defense. 
So to me, this is what we have to say is, boy, let's do more of that stuff okay. and let's stop doing. Like I like regulating for transparency, right? I mean, SEC guidance is 2,500 words to say boards, if something's materially significant, you've got to treat it like it's materially significant and report it in your 10K. 2,500 words. Imagine the leverage that we got out, that, that we can get out of such things if we say let's do more of that. And you tend to get leverage through the private sector. It's tough to get leverage by saying we're going to hire more GSs. You can do it, like DHS grants. If we, take, if we could have DHS grants to some of these groups that are already doing important stuff, mm -hmm. that might be one way to take the, the resources of government and this agility of the private sector. Uh, let's, sorry, please go ahead if you want to jump in. I just yeah. wanted to uh, say, first of all, Jay, great job in putting defense in front of offense. Uh, Tom Goldberg, I have two companies, ATS and Lineage. Lineage makes secure <coughs> hardware. Oh, good name. Bobby knows very well that in, in, in the context of what MITRE has in terms of the toolkits to fix things, how few people use them, yeah. which I think is one problem. You have Senators Rich and King putting forward their bill again that basically says, we're going to give up. We got to go back to analog. Analog means <coughs> if you're a yeah. utility in the electric uh, sector, you're going to manage everything manually. So in the context of this strategy, can you capitalize on what you just said in a meaningful way when the retreat is in full you know, gallop, which basically says, let's give up on some of the internet, let's give up on a lot of IoT, it's yeah. just not a safe place to be. Yeah, I'll tell, you, I'll tell you, I'm very split on that, right? I mean, we've been heading headlong into these things that we know are not not only can we not defend them, they're indefensible. You know, they're, they're insecurable. Um, you know, to me, part of my advice to the transition team is let's own, let's own this courier comment, right? I mean, President Trump saying, you know, with, with one, we want to make sure that we're not all going to be couriering things. But um, to me, a, um, you know, to, a little slowing of the headlong rush into IoT, into smart grids, and saying, let's, let's actually make sure that we do what we said and build security in before we deploy it. Um, we've been saying that we've never actually done it, um, so you know maybe maybe not foot on the brake, but maybe not so heavy on the gas. So the interesting thing about that, and this is where sometimes I have to give up my engineer card, right? I have to turn <laughs> it back in um, from time to time. We, the security community, we, the engineers, we, the tech developers right. and builders, have been saying that, right? You know where it's not said the operational due diligence folks who look at companies to make decisions yeah. about investments, the yeah. people yeah. who make the decisions um, in that space. Um, one of the beautiful things about good strategy is that it can be articulated in very few words. Containment is a good one. Um, my other favorite um, is actually uh, from a woman who, who's here now, right? Best way to, oh, to not have a failed state, employ boys, educate girls, <laughs> right? We can all wrap our minds around those. We need we need to find the clear ways of communicating to humans mm -hmm. who are not engineers mm -hmm. what the kinds of behaviors they need, right? What's the next step beyond be aware? Be aware and ask these questions. Mm -hmm. Those are the leverage points. And so while I agree with all of your uh, sort of framing mm -hmm. of the operations technology policy frame relative mm -hmm. to, to cyber and it having made a difference, it's missing one around what community, what outside of our community mm -hmm. leverage points should we engage? Mm -hmm. um, because there aren't as many, I think, as we think there are. And I think that, that that's also a good point because what, um, what the public doesn't have that government does is actually a motivation to at least try to fix the problem. Yeah, yeah, yeah. There are select industries uh, or there, are, there may be select companies that do have, that are sort of incentivized through their business to bake security in or to at least you know, think about it as, a, as an integral part of their business, but many aren't. And if, mm -hmm. if it's a consumer-oriented business and the consumer is not demanding security, they're not differentiating, they're not gonna pay more for it, then it's very hard 
for a company to justify to investors or anybody else, okay, well, we're going we're gonna to go spend money on this or we're going to charge more for this because it's going to ultimately be more secure. And so then my refrigerator can't be used to go attack somebody else's yeah. computer. I mean, that's not, it's not a calculation that, that, that the broader public, the non-state world is willing to make. Whereas actually, if you put that question to DHS or DOD, they'd say, of course, that I'm going to pay totally more for that refrigerator because down the line, I can see that there's going to be a consequence yeah. there. It's too bad Bo Woods and Josh Corman of the yeah. a, aren't here because um, Bo, uh, Bo had a, um, it was in his office, and he had a some Twinkies on his shelf. I was like, man, we, you know, you have Twinkie? Like, who? And, he's, and he uses it um, in events like this to say, it, are, are, are these Twinkies going to be good or bad for me? Well, you, you can look at it, right? right? You can look at it, and you, we know more about what's in those Twinkies <laughs> and if it's good or bad than any of the software deploy that we deploy, even our most critical systems. So they push nutrition labeling, software bill of materials. Um, and again, for me, it's this regulating for transparency of saying, uh, at least if we can start getting the transparency, and then we can start at least having a better, a better conversation. So one of the interesting things that we're doing at MITRE um, <coughs> Is, uh, is actually building standards around that no, transparency on software. Right. So we've long yeah. run um, descriptions of vulnerabilities, right? So the community common language, if you remember life yeah, yeah. in the 90s, you had products and you couldn't tell which one was better than the other because you couldn't tell which vulnerability, they were talking yeah. about vulnerabilities differently. So we have common vulnerabilities and exposures. Um, we now have common quality enumeration. We and the Software Engineering Institute yeah. jointly working on a standard that will help uh, software companies describe the quality of their product, which can help feed the data in mm -hmm. this sort of uh, asymmetric <laughs> okay. information environment. Okay. The gentleman here on the end has a question. Then we'll come to you, sir. Oh, thank you. Uh, Richard Downey from Delphi Strategic Consulting. Great discussion. Thank you all very much. Okay. Um, I, wonderful <laughs> idea and things of, in terms of, of Making, changing the calculus, making it more difficult for the attackers. Uh, and I, I absolutely agree, the agility uh, and the, for development or technology is, is going to come from the private sector. The, uh, the concern that I have, and I want to ask you about, is the issue of, uh, you know, the government is all about the public good, building the public good. Yep. Whereas uh, private sector, you know, agility is there, but uh, making sure you overcome self-interest is my, I, I wonder if you've thought this through. Uh, and going back to the red Lamborghini analogy, uh, and what you described, the analogy you used was, okay, if Deutsche Telekom knows the Lamborghini is going towards British uh, Telecom, let them know. Great. Um, but what if it's competitors? What if I'm a bank and, and the red Lamborghini is headed for my competitor? It's going to give me an advantage to, um, you know, not to let them know. And how do you, how do you, without government involvement sort of coordinating this or even yeah. funding the technology, all those similar things, how do you overcome that self-interest aspect on the non-state side of it? Yeah. Thank you. Yeah, it's great. And, and, and for my three E's, you know, it's engage, empower, and enforce. And I think there is going to be some, some enforcement. Um, uh, that said, I'm, there, there is a fair amount of invisible hand that, do, that does happen here. I mean, choosing banks in that, um, if you were to choose either the carriers or the banks, those are the places that most share information and say, ooh, boy, we better make sure. Like when the Iranian DDoSs were happening, mm -hmm. what, 2013, um, they would change targets just about every day, and whatever bank they chose was going to have a bad first day. Mm -hmm. But they weren't going to have a bad second day because the FSI sec was going to come in, whether that bank was a member or not, and they said, <laughs> we're the support group. Here are the things that you need to do put these in place, and, and, they, and they came together. This happens a lot, like within groups like Nanog and some of these other, right. some of these other groups, uh, between the big carriers, it, it is happening. Um, Cyber Threat Alliance, um, ICASI, um, a lot of these are happening, um, and maybe we could help them happen. I had been the vice chairman of the FSI SAC. We got a $2.3 million grant from Treasury, 2003, because we are only sharing information with our 50 members. And they said, we'll give you $2.3 million, um, but you're going to re-engineer your technology, and you're going to share with every one of the 13,000-plus financial institutions in the United States, regardless of whether they're a member or not. $2.3 million, right? I mean, that's nothing in what we've spent. And now the FSI SAC, you know, it's winning awards for being the, you know, for being the best information security organization. So um, I, I do think that uh, we can 
there is a problem. We might need to, for example, look at software liability. We might need to look at the responsibilities of carriers and ISPs. Um, um, it's what in public policy we call a synchronization problem. Even when everyone agrees on what needs to happen, we all agree on the same goal of cybersecurity, and we all need to be safer. You've got the synchronization problem of trying to get everyone's interests and lines and actions and what they want to do to start pulling in the same direction. And so I think if we start thinking, what is it that we can do to try and align these? Um, and start, oh, I'm sorry, I'm going along. No, you're not at all. One of the things I really want to do on this is um, go back and say, uh, have DHS um, say, go back and look at big DDoS mitigations, botnet takedowns, big malware t um, uh, mitigations, big counter APT. Who did what? Who took what actions at what point based on which decisions and which, which information? Because um, I will tell you which of the nine players on the field are doing what. And then you can work on that and say, what are information sharing requirements? Um, whom do we need to go help out? Because right now we're doing the incident response plans, and I don't think we've got a good sense of who does what. Thanks for letting me. You bet. Sir, right here in the front, and then I'm going to come to you next, sir. Then I'll go back. Uh, I'm Harlan Ullman with the Atlantic Council. And I'd like to change the tenor of the conversation uh -oh. uh, to see if we can get some real recommendations. <coughs> My concern is that cyber is going to become a health care problem of the next decade, a mess. And it's going to be a mess for two simple reasons. One, there's no theory of cyber yet. And there's no way of operationalizing it to individuals. Let me give you four things to think about while I make a couple of points. First. What does it take to get a driver's license and to drive a car? What does it take to buy a cell phone? What does it take um, if you're a director of a company and you have to fill out the SEC public or private disclosure forms? And what does it take to open a bank account? Just think about that for a second. One of the problems we face from the very beginning is that there's no theory of cyber. I've argued that there have been analogies. The rules of the road in which mariners don't collide, it's taken a thousand years. Nuclear deterrence, we dropped three atom bombs and within two or three years, we had some idea of what it meant. But I think the analogy is the monetary system, money. Money and cyber are ubiquitous. They have very, very similar characteristics. You've got thugs, thieves, so forth. We've come to some idea about how we deal with money safely. We don't have a theory and do not have not yet had a theory about cyber. It's one of the fundamental gaps that exists. For all the commissions and so forth, we've looked at more technical solutions. My point is, if you're worried about, and I think you're right, Jay, I mean, you, need to, you need to focus on the defensive. If you want to buy a car or drive a car, what do you need? You need a driver's license and insurance, correct? You want to buy a cell phone, yeah. you need an ID card. Mm -hmm. Similarly with a bank account. Now, if you're going to buy a computer, would it not make sense to say, all right, before you put your password in, I'm going to give you a little examination that you have to pass just as you have to do with a driver's license. Yeah. If you want to drive a car, you've got 45 questions, and you better answer these, or you can't. The point is that you make this some way of alerting individuals that they have to do this. Similarly with companies, I sit on the board of a couple of companies, we have not been forced yet to take cyber as seriously as we have to. The SEC should yeah. say, here's our checklist. Are you doing it? And by the way, we have a compensation committee, we have a compliance committee, where is our cyber committee? Yeah. So what I'm saying is that I don't like excess regulations, yeah. but in areas that are vital for the common good, there have to be grounds where you take simple steps for the individual, for organizations, and for associations. Yeah. Unless you have some simple steps to do that, it seems to me that cyber is going to become the healthcare monstrosity in the future. And I don't see any reason for change because, quite frankly, it, the debate is not whether you separate NSA from Cyber Command or it's going to be the Department of Defense. What is our theory and practice of cyber? Tell me. You talk about containment. Tell me what the equivalent is for our deterrence theory to yeah. prevent nuclear war regarding cyber. Yeah. And until you get that right, and until you have practical steps, we're going to have lots of discussions, yeah. and it's going to be a very, very nasty process, which it seems to me will not lead to the necessary steps that are going to be required. Siobhan, do you want to say something? And then Jake, well, I just, I just sort of have a question um, sort of related to that, which is, uh, can you have a theory of cyber? Cyber is sort of like a means to an end across a whole yeah. host of it's activities. So it's so encompassing. 
That's interesting. So I, I, I mean, again, the, the answer may be yes, but I, I, I wonder about that because it is, it's, it's spread. I mean, now it's so pervasive across society that I don't, I, I'm not even sure that there's a common definition of what cyber is. I mean, you could have, perhaps you could have a theory of cyber security and what it means to be secure, yeah. but. So thinking around the, the money component of that's interesting in, in terms of a scale. One of the things that we need to do is to uh, is sort of better understand all of the players, uh, right? Because we, uh, from my experience in government, we thought we understood industry. We may sometimes have not understand it, un understood them as well as, or we may have understood less than we thought we did. I, it's sort of unclear. Um, and on the flip side of it, I think um, now being on the industry side of this at a, at a not-for-profit, it isn't clear that industry understands government. Mm -hmm. Right, and so you have that uh, sort of misnomer to begin with as mm -hmm. well. And if you can't, there are some of the players, and the alignment of objectives yeah. is important yeah. here too. Yeah, I think when it comes to theory of cyber, you're right, because we're we're not we're not getting there yet. I, I want to. I was just thinking earlier this week. I want to go back and reread my Tofflers. Mm -hmm. I want to go back and read Future Shock and Third yeah. Wave, because um, those were in the '70s, and they were writing that. And I think they had a really good sense because they were looking at. Um, not cyber, but information and how we're affecting that. And I think any any theory of cyber is, has to include the information aspect on this. And and, um, uh, and and you're right, we're still waiting for that. And we're just doing many side theories based on a little bit. You know, crime has their theory of it. Military has their theory. And um, and and to me, those they were foundational when I got into the field in the '90s. As a matter of fact, Greg Ratcher and I both was war and anti-war by the Tofflers that made us decide to get into this field. So, so for me, I want to return back to those roots and um, um, and, and look for them there. The um, it's an interesting on the because a lot of it is when you say, all right, well, you need to get the license before you can get the computer to go online. We'll probably get killed on First Amendment. But there's been a lot of saying, well, you also have to get your car inspected and make sure that you're not taking a, a lemon on the road. And if you look at some of what's been done in, Sca in the Scandinavian countries, right? I mean. There, if you are taking an unsafe computer onto the networks, the ISPs won't let you connect um, in many cases. And, um, and that might be really tough to try and pull off at scale in a country as large as the, as the United States. But, but you are taking, it is taking that, that analogy further. Now, I really like the idea of pushing with boards. Um, you had mentioned earlier with M&A. Mm -hmm. um, and to me, that's one of those places where you really have scale. That's right. um, every time I would hear someone from government was going and trying to pitch a corporate board about security, I loved the idea, but I disliked the implementation because there's way too many boards. That's right. um, you know, kind of my, my tongue in cheek, which is becoming less and less tongue in cheek, is convince Warren Buffett, convince we um, Calpers, convince Carl Icahn, right? Convince the activists and vent. Right, 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 right. Areas in cyber right. No Before why two? Before Y2K, CalPERS did a, uh, the California pension system, very activist um, investor. And they, before Y2K, went to every one of their companies and said, tell us how seriously you're taking Y2K. Let's get the new team to go to them and say, ask them if they're using the NIST cybersecurity framework or if they're taking cybersecurity seriously. If, we could if I could convince one person to take this seriously, this is only partially tongue in cheek, it's Warren Buffett. Right? If he came out and said, I will only invest in companies that take cybersecurity seriously, I will, take, I will use the NIST cybersecurity framework at all my companies, every board of a publicly traded company in the world, that is hardly an exaggeration, is going to say, holy crap, yeah. <laughs> like, what's this NIST cybersecurity framework thing? Because yeah. it is going to be on every business newspaper. It's, the, it's that, um, what's the leverage point? The, <laughs> yeah, and Harvey's trying to get invited. Yeah. Well, I mean, Carl Icahn's advising the new, the new administration, the right? So. Okay, right here in the middle, and then we're going to go to the back with Harvey. Yeah. Yay, Harvey. Go ahead, sir. Thanks. I'm Irv Chapman. Uh, if you'll permit a very elementary kind of question. Sure. Uh, whenever I read about a breach of security, computer security, it says in the third paragraph that somebody along the line opened an attachment that they shouldn't have. Uh, with all the billions spent on cybersecurity, incidentally, I got a 
uh, an email from the Atlantic Council with an attachment the other day, and I, I stared at it. I stared at it for long minutes trying to decide whether to open it. With all the billions spent on cybersecurity, is there no way to screen out technologically phishing and spear phishing? Or have, in fact, the Scandinavians discovered how to do that and Comcast won't. Yeah. And, that, and that problem is uh, why we are at the present moment that we are with uh, so many Democrats' emails being on yeah. the internet. Yeah. Who would like to address like that, to uh, that, that fundamental like to, question? <clears throat> I'd like to hear from the self-professed nerd, so. Oh gosh, yeah, there you go. Um, so, <coughs> cybersecurity is fundamentally a human problem. I, I, I'd love to say it's, uh, it's easy. There are any number of technologies out there that can help um, in, this, uh, in this issue. It's a matter of who needs to employ them when and where, and uh, uh, helping get those decisions made so they get employed. But uh, it, is a, it is a game, a constantly moving game, right? So um, it, there's always going to be an evolution of adversary action when defensive action goes in place. It is unfortunately why it is easily thought of as a military problem, right? Yeah, because, yeah. because it is fundamentally a, a chess game in that sort, and that is the easiest allegory we have to understand that adversarial yeah. action um, in, that, uh, in that space. Um, so, Yes, technology exists in order to do this. Whether it's employed or not is a different question. The, the other one is um, we, y you have learned to question. That means I think some of the training has been successful. Um, some of this awareness has been successful. We all, uh, we all have to understand how to question, and, and, uh, and we need to continue to teach people that to question that. I think some of the technologies are going to evolve as well. Right? I mean, you think about where we're going in terms of mobile and cloud and other pieces, that that, that entire threat vector is going to evolve uh, fairly well. And you're sort of seeing that happen. If you read the, uh, the Verizon data breach report, you're seeing an evolution mm -hmm. of spear phishing to mm -hmm. other things like waterhole attacks and other kinds yeah. of attacks as well. Yeah, yeah I'm, I'm a bit more skeptical. Um, <laughs> Because I think you know the the, the range of, of how good these things have gotten, um, I don't think we're going to be able to educate ourselves. You know, I'm I'm we're not, we're, I've, I don't I've think we're going to educate ourselves out of the problem. Right. That's true. Yeah, I, I, you know, I'm still uncon. I'm asked sometimes how education awareness fits into my. You got to get defense better. You got to do the leverage, um, and I'm still n not convinced that education awareness gives us the leverage. That if we spend X on it, that we get. 2x or 3x or 10x out of what we spend on on education and awareness, um, and so I think this is though is the classic test of whether you can get defense better than offense is. If we can't do it on fishing, then um, I think that's going to be a um, an indictment on on the idea. But I also think that with something like fishing, um, I mean, I think through education you can get. I don't know, some, some percentage of the way, probably, probably greater than 50%. But the highly targeted phishing attacks, right. um, you know, I mean, if the Russians didn't get John Podesta on one thing, they were going to get him on another. Right. Like, you know, if you right. have a really specific person in mind, eventually you can, you can probably write an email that's going to convince them that it's something that you should read and open because they're getting tons of emails that are totally legitimate that they should open an attachment. We do this every day. And so... Um, you know, dealing with the, the, the notion of phishing, it's, it's not all just, well, why would you be stupid enough to open that? And I don't, yeah. we haven't really figured out how to deal with the proportion of the phishing emails that almost anybody, when given that, in that situation, probably would open it. It's also been interesting to see the amount of victim blaming and shaming that's going yeah, on absolutely. from one side yeah. of the aisle to the other, to which I've said to, thought to myself of those people who've been saying that. Uh, uh, you know, there but for the grace of Vladimir, go you. Yeah. Like, let's hope, that you, <laughs> let's hope you don't become someone's special project right, next week. Yeah. yeah. In the back. <laughs> Double pick. Stereo. <laughs> so, uh, really my name's Harvey Rushikoff. I'm with the American Bar Association. And with, Judy Miller, closer, Harvey, yeah. closer, with Judy Miller, we uh, chair the National Task Force on Cyber and the Law. So Judy and I try to organize about 400,000 lawyers. So we always say, what could possibly go wrong? Um, first of all, it's great to see all of you up there, all my friends up there. You guys do you know, extraordinary work. I love the fact that Jay's written yet another pamphlet, which will sort of guide the discussion. So I guess I'm going to make a few comments and then your thoughts. So the first is um, this issue, we've always talked about this. Uh, is it a hedgehog problem or a fox problem? So containment was much more of a hedgehog problem. 
And as you know, for those of us who did containment, it was rather complicated before we actually developed the norms over time. It was about a five to seven year process. And the father of containment never recognized containment as what he had actually written in his memo. So that's part of the irony. The second issue is the four vulnerabilities that we usually talk about are, and Jay sort of touches on it, is the software. We allow bad software on the market. That has been a market decision we made at the beginning of the process, and we've been paying that price for the last 20, 25 years. We also have a hardware problem. So as Jay pointed out, we know more about a Twinkie than we do know what's sitting on your computer and what's in your phone. And then the third major area is we call them carbon, unit, carbon units. You know them as people. Mm -hmm. uh, those are the people who do the clicking. <laughs> and the fourth uh, vulnerability is we all ride on the ISPs, as Jay mentioned. We don't own the networks. These are, it's a private sector that owns the networks. Those four surface areas create a very set of complexity as to how to go forward. And I've been doing this literally since 1996, when we first had our first attack with the government under Clinton one on DOD. Yeah. So we, the idea that where we're now almost, what is it, 20 years <laughs> later, um, is that there's been a, a recognition of the issue. So my sense is that when you talk about the levers, the project I'm working on with you guys is there's five levers to move America on, on scale. Uh, the first lever is the tax code. That's how you move America on scale. The second lever is um, insurance premiums. That's why you have the way we have our cars. Or when we were first driving seatbelts, yeah. why do you get a car insurance? Why we have these uh, things on the roof for a fire? That's the other big lever. Third is and, um, litigation, uh, the liability issue here, if you want to get a board to have a focus, I advise a lot of boards and when they hear the liability issue, that's what gets a CEO and a general counsel focused. Your third is what we normally do in Washington, which is regulation. So we don't have a private sector, as you well know, we have a series of regulated markets. So Jay has been extremely successful in the financial services because the financial service is one of the most regulated markets we have in the country. And then the fifth is um, treaties. What moves us internationally to adopt certain things, take the WTO. Huge impact to how we do it. So those are your five levers. The question is how do you coordinate those levers on the appropriate pressure points to go forward for us to understand safety? And as Jay has pointed out, Offense beats defense in this space. Now the other issue that we have is AI. So AI is gonna be a very fascinating issue of machine to machine as to what's gonna stop you from opening up your attachments will not be you. It's gonna have to be AI mm -hmm. as we go forward. Mm -hmm. that's, that's where the solution is. If you go to Silicon Valley, that's where a lot of work is going on. And then the other space is what is the appropriate reaction to a clear advanced persistent threat that is state-based? That's what we're struggling with now versus a really smart kid from MIT who I assure you can get into your system with enough time and energy. As we pointed out, the social media, there's no question we construct an email that you will open. There's just no question. So you need AI in order to stop you from doing what's the obvious thing to do. So that's sort of, I see the space, and I'm kind of curious how you all, given what you're all doing, and I need all your emails, because I need you for a project. So um, <laughs> I, um, I have to understand, like, given that frame and that framework, where do you guys all see the, the system? It, Harvey, can you repeat, repeat the first one? I didn't catch it. Tax. Which one? Tax. Tax. Okay, tax. Thank you. I, my father, to this day, when he died, the greatest act of rebellion was I did not become a tax attorney. He saw it as an incredible <laughs> act of extraordinary Thanks. viciousness. I just didn't I've come it. back to the issue as why tax is critical. <laughs> Thank you. I, I mean, I think I've been actually sort of surprised that insurance hasn't become more of a point of leverage. I mean, obviously, cybersecurity insurance exists, um, but the measurement of risk around that has been really hard. And there are some folks who are thinking about it creatively and coming up with different ways to do it. Um, 
but it's interesting because uh, even when I hear those discussions, it's more, well, how does a company then use cyber insurance to buy down risk so that then they don't necessarily, they have to do some stuff around cybersecurity, but if they get hit, then that's not a risk that's holding them back. So they can still go make a, they, they can t make a business decision and just not have to worry about the cyber risk. That's not necessarily gonna get you better cybersecurity, but it's just gonna shift the cost of the risk to somebody else. So it facilitates business, which is very helpful, um, but I don't know that that gets you to the answer in terms of you know, making cyber defense great again. Hmm. Yeah. That's the next hashtag. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. Yeah. Um, so I don't, you know, I don't, I, and, and litigation is very slow. Um, so I, I wonder, the, at least the, the levers that you pointed to, um, I think all may work to some degree, but unless they're working in concert, you're going to sort of have some things going on over here, some things going on over here. They're going to be at different paces. They're not going to be synced up, which was an issue that, that, was, that was raised earlier. Um, and you know, I think that I think that each of them may have some impact on some industries, you know, more than others. But I'm not sure that that gets us completely where we need to be. And I don't mean just to shoot it down because it's not like I have a better answer. But I have been really surprised that insurance, in particular, hasn't actually moved the ball a little bit faster. So I think this uh, this idea of an impedance mismatch in speed is is an important one for this. Uh, kinds of thing, right? These are, you're, you're right, when you think about regulation long term, there are, these are the methods by which we, levers by which we, um, we use. None of them happen quickly, so how do we enable them to be responsive to the kind of environment that we're talking about, or at least the kind of environment we perceive that we're talking about? I think you know, our, our idea of speed in cyber is sometime its own misnomer um, <laughs> as well. It, things don't always happen as fast. The red Lamborghini may go really fast um, sometimes, but mm. it, it certainly didn't come out of nowhere um, in, yeah. in a number of instances. Um, that are here. I, I do agree that AI is going to change basically everything. Um, I don't know that it's going to make everything better. Mm -hmm. Right? I mean, I think that's an unanswered question at the moment um, in this space because it works to everyone's advantage to be a part of the, uh, a part of the environment. And so the real question is going to be what are the leverage points within that transition, that transformation that occurs. Um, I I've used to be asked a lot, what was it that kept me up at night, right? Everybody wanted you to answer mm -hmm. Russia or China. The least or creative or question something. around. Right, <laughs> it is, it is. But you got asked it a lot. Um, and, and what I always used to say, which is unsatisfying, is um, that uh, what always kept me up at night was the inability to construct an agile environment for prevention and response, mm. right? Because it's got to be, for D to beat O, there are a lot of things that have to happen, but one of the things that has to happen is the construction and reconstruction of an agile environment to engage um, between all of the non-state actors and the government. And, and we have to figure that part out as well. Um, yeah, and I, uh, I'll start with the AI, and I agree with that. I remember, I don't know if you were in the group, in maybe 2000, we went to DARPA and Sammy Sadrian to see his work that he was doing mm -hmm. on auto autonomic defenses. And like, oh, what a great idea. I mean, okay, that, you know, it's been 17 years now, right? And we're still kind of, we're still, some of that's come in place. Um, yeah, I, I come down on the same on you, and, and, and I agree in the sense that you're talking about um, this being done automatically, autonomically, Harvey, com completely agree in that, you know, we need better heuristics that's in the software yeah. that can make these decisions, because clicker is going to click, right? I mean, this right. is, this is going to happen, and, and the computer's going to be able to figure that out, and maybe that's going to solve phishing, but then we know the, the other side is going to do something. In, in this work that we're doing with CEPA, Columbia University SEPA, again on this, the leverage, um, to me, I, I, I see AI as a curveball. Um, AI, supercomputing, you know, uh, basically autonomy <coughs> in general. Um, and to me, it's one of the core questions that I bring up of imagining how, cyberspace, how conflict in cyberspace cybersecurity might be different in 10 years. Right? I was just reading The Economist that pit trading for commodities. Mm -hmm. You know, in, in Chicago, they used to have 32 pits where the guys, and generally all guys, would be yelling at each other and making these trades, you know, from trading places um, you know, um, uh, and happening. And now they're like to nine because it just happens now between algorithms because, right. um, because it's easier. 
Um, and so when I start saying, all right, well, why do we think we're going to have human cyber defenders in 10 years mm. versus we've got al our algos and our bots and they've got their algos and their bots? Right. Um, did anyone go to DEF CON um, and, and see the, the Cyber Grand Challenge mm -hmm. this year? I mean, seven supercomputers super on stage that were automatically detecting what software they had, what vulnerabilities were in them, de deciding whether to patch that vulnerability or to throw attacks um, at the other supercomputers so they could score points on scoring attacks on those. And these supercomputers were, were randomly gen uh, were generating away and discovering vulnerabilities and attacking one another. And so what are we going to do in 10 years when someone throws out a supercomputer-driven Stuxnet? It's calling back to the cloud. It's updating, it's updating itself based on what Watson or whoever is telling it it needs to do. To defend against that, you've got to have your own supercomputer-driven AI, um, uh, AI bot to defend against it. Um, you're going to have to have managed supercomputer um, security <laughs> services. Um, and, and tell me why that's not going to happen, that human cyber defenders are going to be as rare as a floor trader on the New York Stock Exchanges today. What's that going to do to the cyber mission force? What's that going to do to the small and medium-sized right. enterprises? I mean, it's great for DoD because, hey, they've got, they've got supercomputers that can, do, that can do this. Tell me why that's not going to be a likely future. Um, so I'm very worried about that. And to close out, because I know we're getting late, I would add a few other levers, Harry. I know those are the big five. But we can do things like grants. I think grants are important. We've got nudging. I mean, there's, there's little nudge things that we can do. Um, and, and I think these are, I've been reading tools of government, like this big, thick manual of, of public <coughs> policy to help me get through this. And to think about where this could happen, right? You've also got the bully pulpit, right? I always wanted to get President Obama to come out and say, by 2020, we want to limit the number of botnets that are out there to the levels they were in 2010. Right? It's taking this, this language from environment, and it's applying it here and using the bully pulpit. We could say, you know what, ISPs, you're allowed to pollute this much. And if you pollute more than that, it's going to get taxed. Or there's a cap and trade scheme. You own an autonomous system, an AS, you pollute more than this, then you've got to buy credits from someone that's polluting less than that, you know, the Scandinavians. Right? If we start looking at these levers of these tools of government, it can lead us to other ways to get there rather than just regulating for security which we know isn't going to work. So it's, it's working with these boards. It's trying to come up with some more novel ways that bring in agility, but still get us to where we want to get, which is defense better than offense. Um, we, have, we are nearly out of time, but I can take your question and your question, and very briefly we can try to answer yeah, 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 it. We have three minutes, so quick question, and we'll have to make the answers brief. We'll do them both at the same time. Hi, this is uh, Jonathan Nichols. I'm with Fannie Mae. Um, so my question related to uh, Jay's discussion on non-state actors. Um, a lot of these non-state actors don't like or trust the government. If you go to <laughs> yeah, DEF CON yeah, yeah. and talk to the information security people, they don't like the government. So when, when the government says, okay, we're here to help, We've heard that tune before. I don't care if General Alexander shows up and gives a keynote at DEF CON because that dude's trying to weaken encryption. Yeah. Um, so yeah. how does this framework uh, engage that question? Does it improve this relationship? Yeah. Okay. That's yes, it. Sir? Um, organizing data so that we understand the risk posture globally and, and nationally. And the, the point Jay made in terms of bots and botnets is a critical piece. The ISPs can see the bots. We had a strategy with the FCC, it's not being implemented. iCode in Australia, Clean Cyber Center in, in, uh, in, in, in Japan. We're not looking at what the data is on the frequency, impact, and risk of malicious cyber activity. Cyber insurance is the biggest missed, failed dream yeah, yeah, in the last 15 years, and it's not going to work. The way it's going to work, in my humble opinion, before 20 years, is as we affect the due care and due diligence requirements of American companies, that they need to understand their risk, and they need to mitigate their risk, and they have to have cyber insurance. And so yeah. then you have certain requirements for whether you can have cyber insurance, and it's got to be like using the NIST framework, that kind of thing. Yep. Okay, very brief responses to any of those. Sorry, sir. 
Okay. Um, the uh, yeah, I agree on the insurance. I mean, there's only like maybe nine or ten billion in in, in insurance premiums right now. It, it, it's tiny. Um, our, car, our colleague Rob Kanaki, read everything Rob does. He's fantastic. He's come out and said we need a trio like a federal insurance backstop. That, that that's going to help. That I th I think that's a great idea. It'd certainly be one of my recommendations to the new administration to try and get insurance to be to be where it needs to be. And John. Um, your point. I think that's great. I mean, there, there's only so much that we can do on that. I think if we can, uh, as we de uh, demilitarize, you know, um, you know, more to, more to NTIA on this. Um, it was great to see how much they um, out at DEF CON they welcomed in some of the folks that weren't from the from from the national security side of government. Um, you know, we can offer grants, and you know, some some organizations to like hire executive secretaries to help these groups work more effectively. Some groups are going to like that, and some groups are going to stay, stay the hell away from it. Um, at a minimum, I want to help the government know that they don't need to recreate this. They don't need to get involved in it, because these solutions are already happening, and they're not necessarily knowing. So, um, uh, so it's going to have to be with care, but at least we've got to start educating um, DC. And that's why I was glad Jeff Moss wrote the forward, because Jeff and I, Jeff has been so key in trying to make that happen. So we have to educate DC, um, but we have to figure out how to keep this from being a, a conversation that only happens in the meccas, right? In the DC area, <laughs> yeah, in the yeah. Silicon Valley area. There are, you know, six cybersecurity meccas in the country, effectively. Yeah. And, and we have to find a way to engage more than them mm -hmm. in some meaningful way, I think, to make okay. a difference. That's, that's really the only way any large public policy yeah conversation has moved forward. Yeah. Yeah. And, and I do think that, I mean, just around the, the trust <coughs> issue, which I think is um, is an important one. I think that if, if the government is seen as playing sort of a less overbearing and more sort of useful role, um, you know, everybody would be incentivized to kind of be working on it more collectively. Um, mm. You know, I don't have the answer as to how that happens, but I mean, I do think that the, the general direction in Jay's paper obviously goes that way. Okay, well, thank you to Jay. Thank you to Bobby and Siobhan, our panelists. Uh, thank you to you all for being here and to the Atlanta Council for hosting. Have a great evening. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you for